And again, now I would like to introduce our panel around respectful collaborations in this space. And our three panelists are Greg, Greg Castro, who I introduced this morning, Janet Eidsmith, sorry, and Dr. Shannon Tushingham. And I would like to introduce each of them briefly and then turn it over to them. So I, um, Greg, I'd like to introduce you again for anybody who missed it this morning. Greg Castro is Salinan, Rumsian, and Ramatushaloni in terms of indigenous heritage and has worked to preserve his Ohlone and Salinas heritage for three decades. Greg is the Society for California Archaeology's Native American Programs Committee chairperson. He is principal cultural consultant to the Association of Ramatush Ohlone, advising within their San Francisco Peninsula homelands. He's a writer and activist within the California indigenous community, and he has worked with our ecosystem restoration camps gathering around cultural competence for the past year, which has been a real honor. And Greg brought forward his experience um, with collaborations that work for this panel. Next, I'd like to introduce Janet Eidsmith, who has 45 years. Hi, Janet. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Who has 45 years of professional experience in cultural resources management and compliance, having been employed by several federal and state agencies in the private sector as a solopreneur consultant, and since 2009 as the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for Blue Lake Rancheria in Humboldt County. Her work experience has been focused in California, especially the Northwest, as well as Hawaii. She is a professional archaeologist and holds a BA in Anthropology and Archaeology, a Master's in Cultural Resources Management, and multiple specialized training certificates on historic preservation laws, policies, and best practices. She has developed curricula and taught dozens of cultural resources management workshops for Indian tribes, state agencies, and local governments on historic preservation compliance, Native American monitoring, and consultation. Her life's work has been to get Indian people to the table front and center when decisions about their cultural patrimony is at stake. Thank you. And next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Shannon Tushingham from Washington State University. Dr. Tushingham is an assistant professor of anthropology at Washington State University, where she is also the director of the Museum of Anthropology and Northwest Archaeological Research Laboratory. Before coming to Washington State University, she served as Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Elk Valley Rancheria in California. Her approach is explicitly collaborative, involving research with contemporary descendant communities. Studies are developed to incorporate their issues of concern, which include broader re impact research issues revolving around historical ecology, sustainability and management, ancestral diet and healthy traditional foods, traditional versus commercial tobacco use, and responses to threatened access to critical marine foods and natural and human induced impacts on these resources. This includes an upcoming archeological field school at Washington State University on indigenous collaboration, landscapes and heritage management, which is delayed right now due to the pandemic, mm -hmm. but still up and coming. So I would like to turn it over to the three of you and Greg for any of the questions and format. And again, we're so grateful to hear you in conversation, knowing each other and good work over the years. Uh, hi, it's Panika, and uh, thank you, uh, Joanne and the uh, ERC committee uh, for allowing me to uh, yak at them for many sessions over the last year and uh, leading to this day. And uh, I just wanna give a shout out to my friend, uh, Katja. Um, that I, I recommended their book, her book to the committee uh, quite some time ago and they were so enthralled that they decided to invite her. And I'm so glad she did the keynote. The only problem is having to follow Katja 
in any <laughs> talk that she gives <laughs> um, because it's, you know, it's like, okay, let's everybody calm down now. Um, but if we need somebody to do indigenous strafing of truth bombs, uh, I always call Katja. Uh, she does such a great job and everybody comes out relatively unscathed, but hopefully uh, changed by what she has to say. And it was so apropos to what uh, this uh, community uh, ERC is doing. Um, my experience with uh, ecological restoration actually is very long-term, but siloed in the native community, which was separated from the rest of the world in the work they were doing. And now the last few years, they've started to come together. They are, uh, I became aware of them a couple of years ago in Echo Farm Conference, which was in my backyard, uh, Rumson uh, territory uh, at Asilomar for 40 years. And I didn't even know about it. They asked me to do a, a opening prayer and land acknowledgement a few years ago. And that's when I became aware of this entire community and movement and aware that native people were connected to it, but in kind of a vague way, a haphazard way, if, if that's the appropriate term. And so have been working with others to try to solidify that connection because uh, we believe that uh, the land needs us as the original caretakers and uh, the world needs us to help them figure out what is going to happen in the future, uh, depending on what we do. So um, I also have to say that, you know, the, the information she gave after almost 30 years, and of course, I've been steeped in some of this information, knowing who I was since I was a child and 30 years working in the community. Um, you do have to get a little bit of a thick skin when you hear some of this stuff. Uh, the, the real history that uh, uh, Kacha revealed here. Um, but at the same time, uh, there's that joy she talked about because we have a much longer history, 15,000 years um, and going. Uh, but our elders tell us, our elder scientists say, we've been here since the beginning of time. And so uh, we have something to share. We have something to offer. And uh, we need the land and the land needs us. So um, how does that happen? Well, in the community, uh, ERC community, uh, I've been encouraging them to forge relationships with native communities in their area. And as Kutcha rightly said, and I think I said in my opening, um, wherever you are in California, there's gonna be native people, whether you know it or not. Um, you just have to find them, um, assuming they wanna be found, and that's an issue. Um, and as that history that Kutcha talked about, sometimes they don't want to be found or they're just coming out of that framework being raised uh, from by elders who remember much harsher times. And so becoming visible is actually a process for us. Um, after being here 15,000 years, the relatively short history, 250 years is like a week for us. And just last week, we were being uh, killed outright. We were being enslaved. We were being oppressed. Our land was being taken from us. So here we are this week, so to speak, uh, being asked to uh, share our knowledge about the land that was taken from us. That's sort of the crux of the, uh, so how do, how do we work that? And that's what we're going to talk about today. And I'm so honored and pleased for my two friends, Janet and Shannon, to be part of this. And the reason I chose them specifically is as non-Native people coming into the community to talk about the process of how they experienced it, what their experience with uh, was, and uh, especially uh, what their knowledge was before, during, and after. And I'm going to start with Janet because I know her story well, from, from from Florida to Colorado to San Diego, if I remember correctly. So Janet, can, yeah, you can you can share that please with us. Well, this is a, my middle name is Polk. So that was the guy with the manifest destiny. I and mean, he's supposed to be a relative. So <laughs> eventually I made it to California and I had a, I had a, a bachelor's degree in archaeology and no idea how I was going to get employed. I didn't know that there was a whole industry that had come about due to the passage of historic preservation laws and environmental laws in the late 60s and early 70s. So I showed up in San Diego, got a job as a Kelly girl secretary and a, a waitress. <laughs> and then somebody said, you know, there's archaeology in the yellow pages in San Diego. There was more work in 1977 in San Diego for archaeologists 
uh, in, to do work in compliance with the California law, California Environmental Quality Act than any other state in the union. And I started working for some small firms because I could spell archeology span they hired me. I mean, it was kind of that <laughs> rugged. And I'm living on the coast and most of the projects and the development that was happening in the places I was surveying and realizing I'm looking at this land before it just gets totally ripped apart for housing development, you know, developments and subdivisions and shopping malls and, you know, highway interchanges because you know highways are crazy in San Diego. And I looked around and I had no idea there was any California Indians because I never saw them and nobody talked about them. And it was only because I hadn't driven inland to the kind of hidden valleys of interior uh, San Diego County where there are a number of uh, tribal properties, tribal lands and um, Paula is one now that I think of because I went there at Paula Reservation because the, I work with the, that TIPO, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. And, and so in the beginning, in the beginning of my work as an archaeologist, you know, I saw Indians kind of way off in the distance, but the archaeologists, they didn't, the professors at the University of Colorado, they did not even bring up the subject of working with Native Americans. It was like, they're gone, they're done. We're not even gonna bring them up. And then when I got to San Diego, uh, it, wasn't pra it wasn't common practice then, except for one instance, Caltrans held a meeting because they were doing a highway interchange and there were some Indians that were really upset about it. You know, and I had, I wasn't working on this project, but I'm wondering, you know, what is going on that these guys are so, you know, inflamed so that was my introduction to California. And, and I moved, I suddenly, I found myself in 1980 up in Northwest California where Kucha described this land of such strong tribes with, you know, recovering and large populations, recovered populations that are in their traditional homelands that are still, they identify with their, their creation places, they're not removed from them. And so um, I, I began work, I met a couple of key people on the Yurok committee, Walt Lara and Joy Sunberg, and they encouraged me. And the light bulb went on when I, I was working for the Forest Service initially. And I was sitting at a table and they were debating, you know, what should be the protection measures for these archeological sites in the, in the area of these timber sales. And this is along the middle Trinity River drainage, beautiful country, Chimerico territory. And I'm looking around going, you know, why are they asking me? Where's the Indians at the table? So I, you know, the light bulb came on. It just, it was the right thing to do. I mean, it was, and it was odd. It was an archeologist reaching out to Indian people. There was no, there was hardly anybody doing it. Let's just say it that way. And, I was not very popular with either the archeologist who would call me kind of a blanket ass. It's kind of a derogatory term of somebody that might be hanging out with our friends. And um, the Native American people that I met it, uh, looked at me like I was a grave robber because that was the history of archeology. span And um, again, a really good book to read is um, Brave Matters by our friend, um, um, help me, help me with the name. Tony Platt. Tony Platt. Yeah, guys, thank you. So Tony Platt wrote about the social history of anthropology in Northwest California, which is, if I had known that I would have gone running, screaming into the night. <laughs> if I had been yeah. more astute and aware of that situation. So that was my introduction to California and the difficulty of, you know, kind of starting off as an archeologist realizing that really it's the Native American people, it's the, it's the people that need to make the decisions on what happens to the cultural resources. And there are cultural sites everywhere, even in the middle of cities, even underneath schools, as we recently found out here in Humboldt County on a project, you know, that there may be developments that are on top of these places. 
and they still have meaning and they have they're important to Indian people and they need to be the ones uh, we do the best you know in complying with the laws but to make sure that tribal people are speaking for these places and what's been really great about such a long span I just had to redo the math I think it's 42 44 years doing this in California doing this work and it's under the the aegis of a bunch of historic preservation laws. And I have been able to watch the growth and these laws catch up with what I started doing back in the late 70s and early 80s, which is to consult with the people and bring them out, have them make decisions, talk about repatriation, talk about even if there's gonna be any archeology span work. Um, and you know, that's, I've always tried to make it really clear that, you know, archaeology is an option. I can share with you what what you might learn from archaeology, but I don't push it. You know, it's because it's that's not appropriate. And, you know, I, one of the key things that I learned too was, is I know because I was considered, you know, archaeologists as grave robbers, it took me a while to really grasp what is you know the difference in the Euro-American, uh, our Western view of treatment of the dead, how fascinating skeletons are, and the Native American view of respecting the dead and not disturbing your grave sites. You know, and finally Walt Lara, I think, was the one that finally really expressed it so well for me. I won't repeat it quite the right, but you know, he said those grave items, those things that, that the people were buried with, that's how they are recognized when they get to the next place. They, they must have their regalia. They must have those items with them or they won't be recognized, they'll be lost. Yeah. And that made sense to me. So anyway. So, so let, me, let me say that uh, one of the reasons that I probably shouldn't have clarified this first, but I mean, your, your examples are perfectly apropos because the reason I'm having you as archaeologists come in and your experience with that is because this is the path that the ecological restoration camps are going on the whole ecological movement is going on they're just entering into something that the archaeology community has been doing for decades and um, they had a history of uh, that they had to overcome going back generations. And now we have this new, relatively new generation of archeologists who didn't do that, don't wanna do that, but they have to deal with that history and the systematic uh, resistance to collaborating or even acknowledging native people. Um, one thing I was gonna have you do, and I'll, I'll throw it to Shannon here because you were also a TIPO and we've used that acronym, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. So um, Janet's a TIPO now and you were a TIPO before taking your present position. Maybe you can explain briefly how you came into that position and uh, okay. where you were uh, before that in terms of your understanding of native culture. And then what's a TIPO? Um, sure, I've got a little cat friend here that just came up on the desk that's <laughs> accompanying my talk. Um, thanks everyone for, uh, thanks Greg for the invitation and it's wonderful to be here. Um, yeah, Trouble Historic Preservation Officer, I'll talk about that and I, I do um, want to just say my path to becoming a Trouble Historic Preservation Officer, um, you know, I was, uh, it was a circuitous path but you know, I, I'm from Canada. I, I, I went to school um, on the East Coast and then came to California. And um, I work right now and was educated in um, a system of land grant universities. So the University of California is where I got my PhD. And then now I work for Washington State University. And um, it's important to acknowledge that these places are land grant universities. So I work and I'm educated in places that are part of a system where um, tribal lands were expro expropriated from tribal people and we continue to profit off of those lands. Um, so those colonial histories are there with us. Um, and I also wanna acknowledge that right now I'm in Eastern Washington state. Here's a 
view of the beautiful Eastern Washington state. This is the homeland of the Nimipu or Nez Perce people um, and Palouse um, people. And I'm really honored to be here. So I'm part of a, um, a system that has profited off of these things. And I'm also part of this scholarly tradition that you know um, Janet referred to uh, anthropology or archeology span where on the one hand we study and um, native people and we're very interested in native people and honor um, them in that way um, and are very interested in uh, traditional ecological knowledge and all sorts of things. Um, but also our, um, our, uh, our um, scholarship, our, our uh, discipline has really contributed to the erasure of indigenous people. And we have to really work mm -hmm. towards changing that. And we are, and it's, and it's important and powerful to work with native people to really understand um, the context of all of those things. So um, when I was, um, you know, I went through the sort of academic train, my academic training, um, I worked in the real world for a while before going back to school. And I felt like that was really good. Um, and, uh, as an archaeologist, and really, um, you know, I met Native people. I was so interested in their history um, and archaeological sites, and I thought it was really cool. And then got more and more into it, and um, I went through this formal training, and we really, you know, didn't really learn how to interact with Native people. Um, we were not taught um, in the university system how to work with elders. We knew it was important, but that continues to be a hole in the academic system is really how to, um, you know, we, we just send students out to, to these places and don't really tell them what to do. <laughs> and um, in my case, I started working in Northwestern California and I was exceptionally, I'm so, I'm so grateful that um, I was kind of at first probably begrudgingly, um, you know, they, there, here's this weird student that's coming into our lands and is studying uh, our, our ancestral sites, but the, the Talawa community, um, you know, they, they um, some of them took me under their wing and, and um, when I was working with them over the years, I, I learned so much from them. And gradually, um, after I graduated, I was hired by the Elk Valley Ranchery as their TIPO. And um, I really think of that period of, of time, I worked for them for almost seven years as a, a tribal historic preservation officer. Um, and that means that, so tribal historic preservation offices are, um, they, they're not all federally recognized tribes have these offices, but some do, many do, growing number do. And it's a program where, um, it's, it's, a, it's a actually a wonderful expression of tribal sovereignty because, um, tribes that, that do these things, they take over the formal um, uh, responsibilities of the state historic preservation office. And so um, they have a direct say in, you know, the, the sort of the management um, and oversight of um, their ancestral places. And so um, what, one thing that we're trained in, and I know you guys are all interested in um, sort of historical ecology and, and um, human land um, management and that sort of thing. But, you know, in the formal training in anthropology and archeology, span many of us, um, and, and it's changing, um, we're really focused on sites and objects. So it was all about really, you know, like studying the material remains of human cultures. And that, that's actually a pretty standard definition of archeology. span um, But in these, um, you know, the conversations that I'm having with, when you, when you work with people at their ancestral sites and you, you work with their descendants, it's a totally, it totally takes on a whole new meaning um, because it's connecting people to the, pre the present day people to these places and seeing that is just incredible. I mean, it brings on this whole other gravity and understanding that is really important to acknowledge. And um, I think what, you know, I, I learned as a tribal historic preservation officer too, that um, so the system that we work in, you know, that there's a lot of um, federal and state laws that protect archaeological sites, um, but there are places too that are important that might not have archaeological artifacts on them, or they might be not what we think of as a traditional archaeological site. So these can be places that, you know, families have returned to for um, for for centuries or, or you know time immemorial. They could be places that um, you know where their origin story relates. It can be places where they practice their religion, and there might not be any, you know, material objects that we can stick in a museum. But there's these places are no doubt 
um, are just as important. So this can that, this can extend, you know, in terms of um, uh, the regional ecology to gathering places. And protecting those places is really important. So when I was a, a TIPO, I would work with um, the community and say, well, you know, the, 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 the agency wants us to tell them which sites are important, you know, where should we, so we're supposed to point these places out, you know? And so people would say, okay, well, but you know, there's this place over here. We don't really wanna tell anybody exactly what this is for, but this is important to us. And I would say, and, you know, I realized, okay, this is more than, this is about a much bigger thing that any, you know, I, I did not receive training in. So I, um, I guess that's part of what, what we'll be talking about here um, in my, my yeah. education and, and just learning to work with people um, in the community. That was something that was really um, important and see all the things that tribes have going on. It's not just, you know, um, historic preservation is just amazing. The journey that they've been through and um, what's happening today. So I'll stop yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> so I was gonna, yeah. So I was going to say that um, w one of the things that that brings up is, is a couple of things. We, you know, we've, we've been talking about archaeology because that's what I've been doing for almost 30 years uh, because of Janet. It's her fault. Um, dragging me into the Native American welcome. Programs Committee <laughs> that I'm now chair of. Um, and uh, it, as Native people, we're approached by these various entities with their focus that in, in the case of archaeology is material culture, as you said, stone and bone science, as others say. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and other people come to us uh, you know, about a, a place that has other values to them. We don't view those as separate. They're all, you know, inextricably connected to each other. And they're also in, inextricably connected to us. And I think that film at the end about mm -hmm. the return of Tulawat uh, yeah. really shows that, you know, mm -hmm. it's not just a physical place. It's not just dirt on the ground. These are living things to us that are part of our tribal community uh, they're a relative, uh, just like a grandmother, an auntie. Uh, these places are living embodiments of our culture, and we treat them that way. And we can't separate that the archaeology versus the ecology versus the agriculture aspects of it. Um, they're all integrated. So when you, you approach a tribe from that aspect, when you approach a tribe, if you want to build a relationship uh, for your ecological restoration camps focused on farming, you're going to get a lot more because that's what it means to the native people. And just like we said earlier, there's going to be native people every, virtually everywhere that there's going to be a camp that you have to be aware that on the land, there's a likelihood there's going to be a sign of a, a, a presence of native people physically on the land. So that is something that you all need to be aware of that cultural resources are all throughout the, the, the state, the country, the continent, and you're going to encounter them. They're not all found and enumerated uh, with trinomials and cataloged. Um, a lot of them are to be discovered as they're being worked. Uh, in the past, some were discovered and hidden. Uh, again, Tony Platt's book talks about that uh, before the cultural resources laws came in in the 1970s and 80s. Um, and they can be rediscovered and, uh, and that has to be dealt with. So that is something that there's a legal as well as a moral, ethical, spiritual component and a responsibility that goes with your land uh, that you're gonna be working. So that is part of the process and the reason why I do encourage the communication and connection to tribal communities. And when you do that, and the, both of these uh, ladies can talk about this, when you do reach out to the tribes, the impact on the tribes themselves, because most don't have huge amounts of resources and people to devote to these projects. So it's a huge impact. So maybe you can speak to that. We'll go back to Janet. Uh, you're currently working with uh, Blue Lake uh, east of uh, Arcata up there in yeah, North on the Mad River. Yeah, Mad River. The um, one of those exploration parties. They got to the Mad River and they were not getting along too well, so they punched each other out 
named it the Mad River. <laughs> anyway, what a great story. But so I've been a tipo um, at Blue Lake Rancheria, which oh, when you showed, when Kucha showed, and I saw Ted, my my uh, colleague at the who's a tipo and the chairman at the at the Weot tribe. I worked for one of what we call the three Weot area tribes, and and this is something that folks in the land projects and farming are going to also run into that there may be multiple tribes that are claiming an area. I mean, the way it's just kind of the way that the, the dice have shaken out over time. Uh, Blue Lake, um, like Elk Valley, actually, they were established and many other places as rancherias. That's a funny Spanish term for a little Indian reservation. And they, these places were established under a law and presidential proclamation in the early 1900s of, as lands for homeless Indians. So Blue Lake is actually, even though it's physically located within the Weot territory, and I forgot to do my greeting, Pawat Lo, <laughs> Pawat Lo is Weot for hello. So, um, but Blue Lake is located physically within the Weot ancestral homeland. And its members are from multiple different Indian groups, you know, their descendancy. But what we do with the TIPO program, they decided is to help support the, the place where we are located, which is the Weot ancestral homeland. So I work very closely with Ted Hernandez and the Weot tribe and their TIPOs and the Bear River Band of the Ronerville Rancheria and their TIPO, Erica Cooper, um, and what we do, and we, and I went to work for Blue Lake because I saw that these three tribes who may have other different values and issues among them, um, they all got together and came up with unified recommendations for protection of cultural places. And they were 100% successful in getting those recommendations adopted by the, the various, whoever, the local, Humboldt County Planning Department, the cities of Eureka and Arcata. So, you know, the jurisdictions that, that are administering these laws and are looking for the compliance. And so the TIPOs are asked the questions for every development in, this, in, their, in, in their areas on whether or not there's gonna be a, an effect on a cultural resource of importance to the tribes. And, and so, you know, being able to work with two other tribes and really we look to the Weat tribe as the traditional tribe that has the traditional knowledge and we'll let them speak. We'll, you know, we'll encourage and support them to go up and speak. And then what they say, we back them. You know, that's just huge. Um, and it's important to, to recognize that again, there, there may be multiple tribes in the area that you're working. And my, my approach was this is like when I first came, met, found uh, Greg Castro was, was to throw the net as wide as possible. You start asking people, you know, I'd like to talk to people of Selene and descent or we out descent. And if they're not federally recognized, you may have one name, but if you talk to that person, then you may have five names and you talk to those people and it just spreads because and how it worked for when I met Greg, it was the Selene and you guys were really kind of just coming out of the closet. It was timing. And yeah. I was working on a big contract at Fort Hunter Liggett military installation yeah. in the, um, the back from coastal area of the Big Sur coast. So it's just over the first big ridge, the San Antonio and Nacio Mento River Valleys. And this is the Selene and Heartland. You know, and what I had to start that project that lasted a few years working for the US Army on this big contract was, was one name from an archeological report from the 60s. And then with that, yeah, with that, I, I found, I tracked down that person, I got a few more names. And then I think within it, what, about a year and a half, I think we had about 130 signatures uh, submitted to the U.S. Uh, Army that yeah. there was concerns, and you guys, we got you out on the landscape. Oh my God, that was that, that may never happen again. It was just a miracle it did. But yeah, 
because these beautiful places in the homeland had been used uh, as it's a live gunning range and, and they were shooting at the rock outcrops that had the rock art on them and the big shell middens at their bases and they were using them for target practice. And there was live duds everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, I mean, but that's that's how it works. You just, you, talk, you start talking to people, ask them. And then I think my, um, the, the Society for California Archaeology, you know, that was a venue that in, I think, 19, I forget what year, 1990, they established the Native American Programs Committee. Right. And, you know, Greg, who I had met um, with the Celine and Project at Fort Hunter Leggett, that was the first workshop that we gave. And we just thought it was so successful. We brought like local archaeologists and the feds, you know, people from the Forest Service and the Army and the county and practicing archaeologists and tribal people and children and you know put together this several days of a workshop to help train uh, who would people who would serve it possibly as as monitors during projects that require observation by a tribal person it side by side maybe with an archaeologist you know, because there's yeah. different values and issues being represented in the field by those monitors. And the Native American Programs Committee, I mean, that which Greg took over now about 10 years ago. Thank you, Greg. And he co-chaired with me for a number of years. So yeah. He's probably going to die in the prison, not, but not die. But he's going he's to kill, it it might kill me. <laughs> it might kill me, though. <laughs> it might kill you. But the really important thing was when, you know, I first went to this SCA meeting, you know, it was a bunch of old dinosaurs, old crotchety old men who were really kind of, I remember hearing them when NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act passed. There was this, there was this scene in a bar in San Francisco at that meeting where the, where the old guys, the dinosaurs were arguing with the young Turks about whether or not it, it's a good idea to give these people their artifacts and their bones back. I mean, really, it was uh, beyond the pale for me. So <laughs> I, I'm just lucky that I was born in 1953 and I may be old as dirt at this point, but at least I, you know, I came out of the dinosaur thinking and I, you know, little by little and with so many people that I love and that are that have been helpful and are um, so good at, at voicing things like Greg as a writer and Shannon too as a scholar who who does the most wonderful work that that any all of us are interested in. They're going to save us. That's what you guys are going to try to do. You're going to try to save us <laughs> with this conservation stuff and. Yeah get those Indian people on board. And what we haven't covered in this is this concept of tribal ecological knowledge. The TEK acronym is kind of funny, but boy, it yeah. is at the core of it all. It is at the heart of all of what we need to do to move and get out of our predicament and have a future as human beings. So. Well, some of that is still embedded within archaeology and the profession, the old school thinking. Um, I always encourage when I got involved with the committee, I, I started encouraging, you know, Native people because there was, you know, conferences where I was the only Native person in the entire conference uh, occasionally, uh, certainly in the room. And uh, I encouraged others. And one person took me up on it. My good friend, L. Frank Manriquez, went to a SEA conference, something she doesn't normally go to. And probably we'll never go again because we wound up in a lecture room where where I won't name the person, but their paper was basically a rant that said all these artifacts in the in the college's uh, archives are ours. We're keeping them. We're not giving them back. Oh, and yeah. she turned to me and looked. you wanted me to come hear this. <laughs> and she's never come back. Bless her heart. Sorry about that, Elle. Um, But that's what that's sort of the thing that we still have to overcome. Um, it's much less. And I have to say it's because of our women folk in the archaeological profession providing a lot of that pressure to grow up for the rest of the old fogies. And um, food. Yeah, and, 
And yeah, when climb you, with food. When you're always, when you're working with Indian people, don't forget to bring good food, food and yep. drink to share with people. It's and it's just, and, and it's more than just practical. It also has spiritual as and social connotations, and that brings up the issue of trust. And uh, I'll have oh. you, Shannon, maybe address that that's sort of the core issue here it is. what i always lecture to agencies that want to work with native people is that it's not a business for us it's not uh yeah. our, it's not our job yeah. it's the very heart of who we are and it has multiple layers of meaning deep you know uh, and unbreakable you saw part of it in the in the films that that uh kacha showed um and it goes beyond that and now you're, you know, people are coming to us asking us to just hand over knowledge. And we're not necessarily going to say no, but we're going to ask, why would we do that first? It's for us a matter of building trust. And it's an ancient cultural tradition when we in, meet up with nearby people or people we're building a relationship for with the first time. We learn to trust each other and know each other first before we get down to quote unquote business. So, in terms of your starting to work up there, and I know we have mutual friends up there in Talawa land, uh, chasing around archaeologists and, and grave hunters occasionally. <laughs> um, what was that process for you of, of that initial encounter and that whole issue of trust? Yeah, I think um, looking back, I just think, oh boy, I was so naive. I didn't know. I, I really didn't know um, what I was getting into or, or how to behave. I just knew that I wanted to treat everyone like, you know, the people I was working with like friends, like you would a friend. And, and that kind of um, developed over the years. And I think looking back, what I would tell and what I do tell students, and right now I'm sort of in this position where I, I'm educating students on these things. So I'm trying to articulate how best to, um, you know, what practices to engage, uh, to, to um, engage with. And it is, it's a, it's a long-term commitment. It's something that, you know, having those conversations and honoring um, people's expertise, um, I think um, really going back to, um, you know, this place of um, ourselves as sort of quote unquote experts, but also looking, you know, native people are experts as well. And, um, and we should honor that. It's really important. I, I do want to get back to something that Greg said before, um, you know, when, if you have the opportunity to work with elders, if you're honored to get that information, to speak with them, you should by all means treat them like you would somebody with 10 degrees. They, th these people are experts. You should honor them if at all possible, um, offering them um, an honorarium or something along those lines as you would um, any other expert. Um, and um, that can, you know, I, I, I don't know the best way to, um, I think it just depends on those personal relationships. Um, and also, um, like Greg said, you know, don't expect all of the information at once. If you are um, given some of this information, regard it as precious and something that you do not necessarily have the right to just give away or publish. For instance, you know, in our my community, I'm under great pressure to publish a lot, but I have to be really, um, you know, I have to think a lot about um, about the down the line ramifications of that, and perhaps something that I write might inadvertently harm a community or, you know, and I was not really cognizant of that. That's something that I've become more cognizant of um, now. And, you know, one of my first inklings was sort of walking in, around an archeological site with um, John Green is a good friend and he's, um, I can now call him an elder. He might get mad at me if I call him an elder, but he, <laughs> he John Green, and um, you know, and and walking around with him, and people would come to me, and they would say, "Well, you know, where did Indian people like get their basketry material?" And I'm like, "You're talking to the expert right here. Why are you asking me this? I don't know." So I mean, there's this kind of interesting um, structural um, aspect of 
things that is important to acknowledge and decolonizing some of those practices is um, takes a lot of thought. So um, I would say, you know, communication with people, um, honoring that information that you're given, making sure checking in with people and making sure that um, you're doing the right thing. That's that's appreciated. Um, what else? Um, and also really regarding people as equal members of your of your team, you know, their, their, their knowledge is, is that important. Um, I would say too that uh, indigenous people, sometimes they're, um, you know, thrown into sort of, a, a, um, you know, they're stakeholders. They're one of many stakeholders. I think native people have, they're, they're on a different level than just uh, stakeholders. Like, <laughs> I, I don't know how better to say that, Janet. I mean, yeah, you've, you've no, that, run across that. that. Yeah, um, they're tribes. You could tell the tribes. They're, they're a sovereign nations. And yeah. the sovereignty thing is, you know, it's getting stronger. I think tribes are, are, are able, are recapturing and feeling that now. Yeah. I mean, you, look at, you look at Ted when you know, he, signed, he signed that document and the island was back to the We Are tribe. Yeah. Holy cow. And he did it on behalf of his community. And that's yeah. part of what tribal sovereignty is. Yes. Um, it's not, a, you know, for, for Ted, I was tribal chair for two terms on, the, on my Salinan side. And I realized it's a, a, a huge responsibility and an mm -hmm. obligation and commitment uh, that mm -hmm. I took as, as uh, uh, not a right or a privilege. Uh, I was acting on behalf of my tribe and, and yeah. still do and, and always act accordingly. And when I do something, it either benefits or detracts from the tribal community. Um, and so that's also part of what you have to understand. You're, you may be talking to one person, even an yeah. elder, but you're mm -hmm. also talking to a tribal community uh, mm -hmm. through that elder um, that, that reflects that. Um, and there's a relationship behind that between the elder and the community that you're not aware of, that you won't necessarily be a part of, but you need to understand that it's there. So for instance, you may ask a question and they may say the equivalent of, I'll get back to you. That's because they might have to go ask permission, even as an elder, mm -hmm. that to share that information uh, outside their community uh, for whatever reasons that are unique and appropriate for them to decide. So there's there's that aspect to it. They're acting on behalf of their whole people normally, not just themselves, even as elders. I remember um, Tony, Tony uh, uh, oh geez, uh, Madrigal um, years ago, he did a presentation at, at a California Indian conference. He was doing uh, uh, work on the EPA document for the Agua Caliente tribe. And I remember one part, the part I remember, because a lot of it was tech, but the part I remember was he talked about the process of, of information being exchanged and he described the tribal people as chief elder scientists. I still use that to the day. I stole that totally from Tony um, because I thought it was a great way to describe uh, the level of, of, of knowledge that you're accessing when you talk to an elder, but it also is, you know, the tribal part, chief tribal scientist is acknowledging that they're acting on behalf of the people. So there's always that behind it. Um, let me ask this part, let me take it off in a little bit of direction. We talked about some of the pitfalls and we could spend a couple of days talking about that. And we might come back to a couple, but how about the personal part for you? What did it do for you personally when you sort of if you ever got over the hump and maybe that never happens, but you know, there was a point at which like, wow, I, I I'm in the midst of something that I didn't anticipate. And, and I'm going to throw it back to Janet. I remember the story uh, early on uh, that Walt and Joy, uh, I think asked you to go to a uh, ceremony at Patrick's point, the village there, Sumac. Um, yeah. And, and that was the first time you'd been to one, I think. Uh, or, or at least one up there, and and what you did, what, how did that work out that evening that you first went to your first tribal ceremony up there? First tribal ceremony. Well, and I was lucky. I had um, when Sumeg was built as a, rep, a replica Yurok village, but in in the Yurok ancestral area of the Nurner people, and in the area of my friend Joy Sunberg's um, relatives were from that general area as well as Waltz, we're from Stone Lagoon. 
and I got to I got to work with the advisory group, your advisory group to the uh, state parks people on the actual design and then building of the village. And it was so creative. They figured out how they could hire all your men and they basically figured out how to split redwood planks and rebuild those houses. They had not done that for a long time. It had been a long time. The Hoopa had rebuilt a number of the old styles onto houses in the valley in, for the bicentennial in 1976. So, so, but the first, what Sumag has become a place where the brush dance is held every year, beginning in 1991, I think. And it is a ceremony, it's a healing ceremony, usually for a child, but it can be also for, uh, you know, an older person. Joy, I think at one point she, she was in the uh, dance pit. And, you know, it lasts, it starts Thursday night and the dance that you saw on the demonstration dance where the two guys were going past each other in the film uh, about Tudelot at the end of that film, that was a brush dance um, dance. And to, to sit, to sit on the benches and it, the, the dance is held inside of a traditional house with the, the roof pulled apart so that people, I mean, this would have been in the old days. They were in a regular village and one of the houses was uh, used as for the brush dance. I would assume that would have been the house, well, this, I don't know, the house of the person who the dance is for. But they would remove the wall, they would remove the roof slabs and people would sit all around the, the house and then look into it. And the dancers would come into the pit, which is a square area with a central fireplace. And there is a medicine woman. She has a medicine boy that's helping her, a girl. And then there's the child and the mother. And the dancers are all lined up around the, the perimeter. Um, and girls are in between the men. And it, the ceremony goes on on Thursday night till about midnight and then Friday's a rest night. And then Saturday, it starts up after dark and it lasts until after dawn. And it's that Sunday morning that the, the finest of the regalia comes out. You know, and you're seeing it by, uh, uh, by firelight. And, it, you know, it's, it's still, I mean, I still, I just, woof, makes my insides feel funny because it take it transported me back to a time I felt sitting up all night with at this dance where it transports me back to a time when we were all one big tribe we all came out of Africa and dispersed you know so I felt such a strong connection to you know really old ancestors and Greg you'll have to appreciate this because I had to find it <laughs> this is my, this is, uh, this is my tribe. A while. <laughs> I know I had went up into the attic last night to get it. <laughs> but you know the and, and and the other is, and this is really important because Kucha's mom and dad were, I think, also so uh, important. I've worked with her dad a lot, and and I know her mother has uh, such great respect, and she was one of the important women when they had the flower dance was the first time it had been held on the, in the Ner Ner, um, Yurok country and was, it was held for uh, Kayla uh, Sunberg and um, a few years ago and Lois Reesing was one of the women. It was, as was, um, you know, the elder, the ladies from the Weyot tribe. It was, it was a powerful thing. So dances are getting revived this, at Stone Lagoon and Gans Prairie, you know, the Yurok have revived now the World Renewal Ceremony. The, the Weot finished the ceremony that was interrupted by the 1860 massacre. That was about three years ago. And when COVID gets settled down, they will then be continuing the dance, which is, you know, come back. These, mm -hmm. these dances are coming back. They have been suppressed for so long. And it's such a privilege that I have, I have the opportunity to work with the three Weot area tribes and, 
and you know do something to protect cultural resources and to educate people about them and yeah. it makes my heart sing that's what it, i'd call it thank you janet um so shannon uh you're up there uh Mm -hmm. and uh, you you become a tepo but beyond that what did it, what did it do for you i know you've had some deep friendships that have continued and we have some mutual yeah. friends up there um uh some very interesting <laughs> wonderful friends up in in that part of the the world um so what did it do for you as a person i think that's what interests you know it's a lot of it's a lot of hard work i think you'd all both say that mm -hmm. and uh but on the other hand what what do you get out of it on a personal level uh, beyond just fulfilling job requirements? <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, well, I was I had you know working as a tipo. I mean, I I was I I bring my 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 daughter um, mm. uh, up with me, yeah. and I used to um, you know. <laughs> I mean, my kids were were brought up uh, with around the Talawa people on the sites. And um, I was allowed to bring um, my daughter in a sling and report to council with her in the sling. And when she started crying, people would take her and hang on to her. And so I feel really, um, I was really fortunate to be, to, to have those friendships. And, um, and I think it really brings out you know, that connection um, on a personal level and commitment that goes beyond just, oh, this is cool. And I just, if I can briefly tell one story that yeah, kind of brought this for home for me. Yeah. Um, so when I was, before I became a tippo, I was working in, up in uh, the Smith River at some ancestral sites in a, that were in a campground. And basically, long story short, we were, um, we were uh, looking at some, we were excavating at some, um, uh, places at a campground. So there was this uh, camp, very popular campground that um, the National Park Service was trying to figure out, well, you know, are the campers impacting an archaeological site? And there were these depressions and they didn't know what they were. So we went in and we were testing those depressions to see if they were houses. And it turned out that many of them were indeed, they mm -hmm. were all houses and they had to eventually shut down that section of the park service. So I don't think the park service really liked me after that, but <laughs> anyhow, um, it was a good thing because it preserved this really important mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. One of the houses on the, on the outskirts, what turned out to be a house, it was this sort of depression. You could, it was covered in um, poison oak. We all broke out in horrible, you know, rashes because <laughs> of working, having to work through that. And it was a, a place that was in jeopardy of, um, you know, having a road go through. And, and so we, we, we excavated in that area just to see, is there a house floor here? What is this? And it turned out that it was indeed a house and we continued to look at it. And um, every day we had tribal, our tribal partners and co consultants were out there and we would talk and sort of say, oh, look what we found. And, you know, this is really fun and interesting. And it was this excitement. There's always this excitement around archeology span because you're, you're finding new things and, oh, what does this clue mean? What is this thing? You know, and so that's always like a real, um, that, that's a really interesting thing. But this house, um, we started to discover some um, historic artifacts, meaning that like um, not just stone points and uh, artifacts that have been used and tools and technology that have been used for thousands of years. There were there, they were those, they had examples of those in the houses, but there were also these early historic glass and square nails and um, pieces of uh, uh, people's clothing, buttons and that sort of thing uh, that were mixed in with what we call traditional sort of artifacts. And it became very clear um, as we were exploring this house that it was a house that had been occupied around 1850 to 18, you know, the, so the mid 1800s. Contact. Okay. Contact. Now, so the consultants, again, I, you know, that my, my partners, my friends, um, this took on a whole new meaning. I, people, I couldn't understand um, at first, you know, the tribal people were sort of, it became, it was a little different. There was a gravity that was going on here. And um, so, you know, this first, when we, when we understood this, um, one of the tribal elders, uh, William uh, Richards, um, he, Bill Richards, he's a good friend. Um, and he uh, said, I'm gonna, I would like to take you and a couple of your students out to Yontocket. 
And um, Bill is a, a logger. He's somebody that is, uh, you know, he's a native person and he was a tribal chair, um, you know, just a wonderful person, um, but not someone that would, uh, I would say, you know, um, would be very emotional or something like that, or where, you know, you, yeah. not, not quick to share. Um, but he brought us out there to Yontaket. Well, Yontaket is the center of the Talawa world. It's their yeah. place of genesis. It's where the first um, white redwood tree um, uh, emerged. And, um, and it's also the place of a horrible massacre. So it's often referred to as the burnt rat massacre. It's sort of the place that is equivalent to, um, you know, what was talked about with for the Wiat. Yeah. Um, and um, and he showed us this place, and he said, "This is, you know, this is what happened in the 1850s. In 1851." Um, we had uh, a world renewal ceremony, hundreds, you know, we all were all gathered here and, and uh, men, women and children were in the houses. Uh, the settlers came here and uh, set the houses on fire and as they emerged, they were shot. And there were only a few survivors and the only way they survived was by um, jumping in the water, a slough nearby the, uh, the, um, the village and um, and just swimming until everybody left. And so it was a horrible massacre. And he was choking up and explaining, this is what the context of this house was. This was his way of explaining to, and sharing with that with us. And my heart is pounding right now, just thinking about that because it became an entirely different yeah. thing to me Real. and understanding and, and him sharing that. Yeah. Um, and not just reading about it, but having, an ancestor bring us to this place and say, this is the responsibility that you have. And so when we were, you know, the traditional archeological sort of, you know, uh, you know, say, oh, well, look at these artifacts. People are acculturating because they're, you know, the interpretation would be about um, native people are using new tools and technology. Well, okay, that's yeah. <laughs> completely different. Native people, they were, they, they were, uh, you know, in this, they were living in this house at this time, and, and uh, they were people were um, being shot. They were they were being forced into reservations. They were there were people that were scalped. It was terrible, and um, they were so committed to that landscape that they continued to live in that place. And that is the connection that is just insane, I, incredible to me. Um, to think about that historically and then how those stories are so important to modern people um, and seeing ta the Talawa community continue to go to that place. And um, now they don't live in villages, but they still connect to that place. And then it's still important to them and they gather there and have family gatherings. So for me, that was, I, I felt, um, it was a, a, a watershed moment for me, I think. And also I feel still responsible for um, explaining that those archeological findings in those terms. And um, it has been difficult to actually, I will say to publish about that place when you mentioned the word genocide um, because that's what was happening. So I, I just wanna say, you know, that was sort of my, uh, my moment. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so it's important to realize that whatever relationship, and hopefully, and it can be a very good one, but behind all of that for Native people is that history that we feel very connected to. It's not discreet. It's not in a little lump we can put into the side. It's not a book we can put up on the shelf. It's been handed down through families in various ways and means. It has huge emotional, mental, spiritual uh, impact on us in the work we do and the work we do actually brings it more to the surface so there's this like I said earlier kind of that ERR kind of, ER kind of mentality we have to do in this work of you know there's there's lots of things happening here that are distressful but we have a responsibility to try but that doesn't mean we're not impacted by it that we don't get emotional about it and 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 i don't have any problem telling you that just watching the the film that kucha uh, mm. kucha showed about the return which i've seen before and i actually was there in the city that day but i was at another meeting about the with the education department for the iraq and we were told half the group wouldn't be there because they were at the city council that day. 
getting signing the the, the mm-hmm. island back. Um, and so uh, and and we all stopped and talked about that because it's not separate from education. It's part of the curriculum people want to you know want to bring back and and in you know teach not only their children as tribal people but the public's children so they know why that happened so it's not again it's not separated so we spent 50 minutes talking about and and congratulating the one year you know uh we are person that that did come to the meeting um to to talk about that passage and even looking at the film it it's quite emotional to me um and I can remember uh, we have one question that has to do with Los Padres and the fire there. And I feel the same way when I go and look at, you know, our homelands there right next to 400 Leggett, uh, just a few miles away, our sacred mountain is there in Los Padres in that part of it. And the fire went all the way around at the Dolan fire and the devastation it caused. And then that was the earlier fire. The one that was just last year came back and did more damage. Um, but uh, so we, you know, it, how do we work with that? How do we deal with that? Well, first we mourn it. We have to, we're still in mourning for that, uh, that history that we have, uh, whether it's distant or not. And we have to, uh, and it's really interesting. You said that Janet, they went and completed the ceremony. And that's what we felt we've had to do a lot that a lot of our people that passed over during that genocidal time, they didn't have the proper, send off so to speak and so one of the things we've done is brought back our burning ceremony uh which is the what happens when we when people cross over and we've named people that we know ancestors and others we know from the past and we do that for them as well as people that have just passed away in the current year we go back and take care of those ancestors as well that's a really important part of of our present day mind uh we don't make that distinction in time either um so there was one question about the because we're at the question point uh the dolan fire in los padres um there's been three major fires since in my lifetime that i can remember um and one of them impacted the place my dad grew up over in french camp which is south of big sur along the coast uh in the which i think at the time was part of los padres it was the biggest fire in the history of the country at the time, 1975, 76. And it took out the cabin my dad was raised in when he was little by his grandparents. Um, and going back um, in 2002, uh, f- for the first time uh, that I can remember, um, seeing the rubble from that cabin was still there. Um, and a part of one of the reasons is they said it was more than 50 years old. So it, it was considered historic. So they didn't want to just toss it. So they just put it in a pile next to the cabin. And all that was left was the brick chimney and the old pot belly stove that, that they used to cook on out on the porch. <laughs> but they didn't want to disturb that either. They just left it just exactly was as it was in 1977. Um, and my grandfather, who was the last one there, my great grandfather, uh, I think he left in 63. So um, the, the cabin, I don't think was used after that. And then in 77, it burnt. Um, and since then, it, there's fires that have gone there, through there twice. Um, mm. They want to know how to be involved. Well, that's federal land and we have trouble being involved. <laughs> 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 um, we certainly offer our suggestions, um, not to give an excuse to any part of the federal government, but the national forest, I know, at least in present day, and certainly in our area, has been cut to the bone and then some in terms of resources. Um, so uh, it's hard to even get them to talk about it, accepting help. And that's sort of one of the things I wanted to bring about with tribes, too. And I think we talked about it earlier that um, tribes have so few resources. And when you guys were both hired as TIPOs, um, you had a kind of a narrow job description, but you found out you were going to wind up doing a lot more and still didn't have time for all the things that you needed to do. And that's pretty much the way it is with all tribes. And maybe you can uh, speak a little bit to that, trying to deal with questions like that. How do you integrate with other agencies when they have resource problems, but you can't take the time to integrate with them in a proper way? So go ahead, Shannon. Oh, Yes. Um, 
Yeah. All right. Letting the dog out. <laughs> Yeah, Janet, the question was about um, how we integrate with other sort of departments at the at the tribe, you know, and maybe you need you could speak to that. <laughs> right well, it, it, you know, I think not well enough. Um, Blue Lake has got I think it's got more employees now than tribal members and their their focus has been largely on economic development. And, and also contributing to the greater community. They, they run food programs, um, uh, you know, lunch programs for a number of elementary schools and summer programs, food programs, senior food programs. They have, you know, transportation, they have a casino, they have a hotel. So- And, and know, those and programs, early, and those programs are not just for the tribe, correct? Well, yeah, those are all those are all just broader ones, and the, yeah. the economic development, you know, is like the casino and hotel. But they don't have they don't pay their tribal members per capita payments. This is an interesting thing that it took me years to understand or learn about. Is that you know some tribes that have casinos like the big ones down in Southern California that are making just buku bucks. Yeah. They pay their tribal citizens um, a per capita payment every month, which could be. $10,000, $20,000 a month. It's kind of like winning the lottery. <laughs> you know, so these people have, you know, basically some maybe have come from and one generation from dirt poor <laughs> to, you know, pretty wealthy. And, you know, I've, I, I go and I see these people from a distance and I, you know, I don't, I don't really, I haven't had any close friendships, but I'm thinking, I don't think this is going to work out well. On the other hand, Blue Lake doesn't pay per capita and people, you know, live kind of modestly, the tribal members on the, on the rancheria and in um, modular homes that are comfortable and safe and secure, but they're not, they're not handed a bunch of money um, every month. And that money is instead plowed into energy development projects. They won a national award for um, their solar um solar project and anyway so and they they plow back into the environmental programs the fishery mad river yeah stuff mm -hmm. and you know i'm always getting stuff on my desk from oh, u.s fish and wildlife that are about critters about animals i usually can address the ones that deal with plants because that becomes gathering but because animals move around that's really hard for cultural resources to to deal with unless they're skins <laughs> of animals or yeah. Others, you know, you're dealing mm -hmm. with uh, regalia. So, you know, I have, I've just, you know, I had made made the decision uh, in in running this program to, you know, focus on, you know, trying to cover the most projects that have the potential for any kind of impact to a cultural site, you know, and that can include a historic non-Indian site if it's significant and not because we're supposed to educate our you know, local governments about the historic preservation laws. And you know, the responsibility, and this is, this is where the Yurok tribe, the early Tippo there, Tom Gates, really did us all a great favor because the Tippos, I think, were envisioned as somebody that would, you know, under a sovereign tribe, just manage the cultural resources on the reservation, on the rancheria. Well, Blue Lake's got 75 acres and no cultural mm -hmm. resources on it. So what do I do? I, I would have nothing to do, right? So, but Tom Gates in his great infinite wisdom, he, he just said, no, we're gonna manage for the Yurok, we're gonna manage the ancestral lands which becomes enormous, you know, for the Weot, it runs from the Bear River Ridge uh, down by Rio Dale, south of Ferndale, all the way up to the Little River, and then inland to the, the ridge that separates the Mad River from the Redwood Creek watershed. So it's enormous. And there's all kinds of things that are going on from timber harvest plans to pot, you know, cult, marijuana cultivation, of course, has been a really big thing here in Humboldt County. But we got that regulated. And we got it regulated in such a good way that we had, uh, amazingly, we had this, a prayer place. And when you stood there, it had the cupules, the little ground dip depressions on the boulder. And when you looked at that, at that rock, at that prayer place, 
and you looked up, the whole of the Mad River watershed and landscape was in front of you and there was no modern developments, no modern intrusion whatsoever in the landscape as far as you could see. And so when they proposed marijuana grows in the near foreground on the prairies below this prayer place, we said, no, 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 no. Let's work to move them out of the viewshed. And so we got three marijuana uh, grow permits uh, and working with the County of Humboldt and really good guys on these, um, actually these growers were, they were good. Uh, some that have come, you know, there's been a bunch of new people that have come to town in Humboldt County since these laws passed. But these particular um, applicants that were really very cooperative and very respectful of the tribe. And we were able to um, preserve that landscape of that prayer place that, you know, Ted, says that when they're ready to do dances, you know, that that will be a place where one of the persons who participates in the world renewal can go to prepare for the dance. It's yeah. just, that, that is stunning. So, you know, there are good stories. There are good stories. There's, there's a few bad ones, but, but by and large, these local governments are paying attention and it took them decades. decades. But you know, yeah. one of the things is that source book that we put together, which was, you know, this thick, this manual that had all the key laws in it and stuff that was important. You could just pull it down. It's like a really good desk reference. Mm -hmm. And that was something I handed to the, the, um, the head of the Humboldt County Planning Department. And I think it, it made a difference. It Differences. woke them up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I bounce um, off of that, actually? Oh, yes, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm, and I just wanted to, um, and I don't know if this was covered earlier in the day, but just sort of, uh, you know, the learning process and bouncing off of some of what Janet was saying too, for me was that um, it's just important to think about, you know, there's no pan Indian or pan California native way of uh, doing things. Yeah. Um, tribe, the tribes today, the history of the tribal communities today is that this, these are artificial groupings of people where that were mm -hmm. sort of, you know, during colonial times squished together in these different rancherias. Um, not all tribal communities are federally recognized. Um, they all have different histories. They have different tribal structures. So you can't, you know, you could learn from, you know, Janet might say, well, Blue Lake works this way. Um, you know, Greg could say, well, my tribe works this way. And, but there's, each one has its own uh, structure. Yes. And, and so you should learn about that. Did you, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. 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 Well, and I was going to say, and they're all equally valid. Yes, exactly. And so it's, and so, you know, like doing that research and sometimes, you know, some tribes have, um, like there's a wide variety of, of, of resources. So some are casino tribes, other ones don't have those resources. Some have um, websites that actually can have quite a bit of information and educational material on there. That's, that's a great place to start. And you can learn about the structure of a tribal community yeah. directly from them. Um, so, and then uh, not all tribes have TIPO, they're not uh, TIPO offices, they might have their own cultural yeah. departments, um, and they might also have a certain designated people that uh, you would be communicating with. So some, you know, you, sometimes it will be the mm -hmm. TIPO, other times it'll be somebody from another office or, or a certain elder that, you know, or from a, a family that is uh, associated with the region where you're you know, your land might be or the, the, the place that you're interested in restoring. Um, and also I would mention too, that um, tribes are, you know, like Janet was saying, and Greg was saying, they have a lot going on. And um, so the TIPOs are sort of, you know, my experience was, yeah, like working with these different offices, um, you have to give them a little bit of time to respond. Don't expect, you know, you, you know, like, things to come back in a week because they need yes. to consider they have uh, various periodicities of meetings. So the tribe I worked for, the culture committee met once a month. Other communities might have it every other month or twice a month or something like that. And yeah. so, uh, and there might be other things on their docket or agendas. So that's just. Yeah, yeah so we're worth. almost, yeah, we're almost out of time. So I just wanted to wrap up with a couple of, uh, kind of briefly address a couple of questions. Um, you know, uh, and, and just speaking of what you're talking about, that's why, you know, when I, you know, talk, talk to agencies that, that want to learn, figure out how to work with tribes, you don't start with a project and treat it as a business, which you have to do before a project even shows up. 
when you first day in your office, find out who the tribal people are in your area of responsibility and go call them and start building a relationship so that when you do have a project, that part of it is sort of taken care of because otherwise the tri tribe's part, if they, you just call them out of the blue, say I'm blah, blah, blah from this agency, they're going to go, yeah, so what? <laughs> uh, even if they have the time, they're not going to just hand you over their culture to satisfy your business requirement or your project timeline. You have to build a relationship with them, not just for the social, spiritual, moral values that come with it, that the tribe has to, is going to entrust you with information. And it's also a practical thing. Why am I going to spend my precious limited time talking to somebody who didn't bother call me when they've been on the job for a year? And the project's been going on for six months, but now there's a deadline next week and they want me to respond. That's not going to happen. So there, there's that mutual respect of, of an agency to an agency or a tribal community that needs to be uh, honored um, and, and respected. Um, the, uh, that, that was one of the questions. And, and it's always about building a relationship uh, before you need to ask that favor, like, I need something really quick. Can you accommodate me? If you already have a, a relationship, you can get away with it a couple of times. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, and that's, you know, kind of about it. Um, again, that, that part that the, the guidelines uh, that we've been talking about here, the, the cultural competence circle has been addressing, doesn't really talk about those two aspects. I got to add that in uh, to kind of fill that out. So, um, I think that's it. Uh, we're a little bit past lunchtime. And uh, so thank you so much, Janet and Shannon. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Ho hopefully it wasn't too traumatic and you can go have uh, coffee ah. and chocolate as appropriate. <laughs> oh, chocolate. <laughs> chocolate. Yay. Yes, chocolate. So thank you so much. And, and everybody, uh, Henry, I applaud everybody out there that is, is looking at this, these projects to try yeah. to restore the earth you know, work yeah. with, with the people, the human beings, or the human beings, save yeah. the humans. <laughs> it's yes. beyond yeah. save the whales now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank so you important. so much. Thank you so much for the invitation, Greg. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you again to all of the